over to our slides and uh, be ready for, uh, for that. Praise the Lord. We'll go over that again in the morning service uh, here directly. Um, <clears throat> but now let's talk about being peacemakers because our world today needs some peacemakers. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to talk about that again this morning. And uh, probably the next several months of Sunday mornings, we'll be talking about being peacemakers. And uh, the principle <clears throat> that uh, I began sharing with you last week is the principle of glorifying God. That will help us be peacemakers. And just as a quick review, I'm going to uh, review uh, a little bit with you. But glorifying God was the first fundamental principle of peacemaking. Then secondly, was getting the log out of your own eye. Boy, this is sounding fun, isn't it? <laughs> but hey, do we not need peace? We do. The third principle is gently restore, and the fourth principle is go and be reconciled. So those are kind of headings that we'll be looking at over the next uh, couple of, of weeks and months. And let me get the, my device turned on here. And uh, remember, we started out Matthew 5, 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. That's the only place in the Bible that that word peacemaker is found, but it's tied to being called the children of God. Listen, if we're followers of Christ, we should be <clears throat> peacemakers, and we will be blessed and happy if we are. We talked last week about this, this curve that... Uh, Mr. Sandy came up with, he and maybe some others, but uh, this is kind of a drawing or a, an outline of, of what we're seeing and what we're going to look at. And so uh, this is, this is uh, what we kind of introduced last week, and we talked about <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, the left side and the right side last week, which are the extremes, which are not really peacemaking, it's more peace faking and peace breaking uh, as we shared, but we talked about the three basic responses to any conflict, which is escape, attack, or being a peacemaker. You got those that try to just get out of it, those that try to, to, to come down strong and say, hey, I'm gonna take control of this, and then you got the folks that try to be in the middle and make peace in the situation. And so we talked about that last week, the three on the left side of uh, the peacemaking dome, suicide, flight, and denial, or denial, flight, and suicide, if we take them from one ex uh, least extreme to the most extreme. <clears throat> denial, we talked about 2 Samuel 13. Flight, we talked about Genesis 16. And suicide, we talked about Matthew 27. On the far right, we had the assault, litigation, and murder peace breaking, the attack side of that. Uh, assault was 2 Samuel 14, litigation, 1 Corinthians 6, which we'll talk a little bit more about this morning. Uh, and then murder, Genesis chapter 4, verse number 8, uh, where Cain killed Abel, and that didn't make peace. In fact, it made for trouble for a very long time. This morning, I want to focus in on the center. Notice that there's six responses in the center, uh, and they as well have a kind of a gentle to extreme uh, flow to them, and, uh, and so we'll see how that works this morning. Uh, overlook, overlooking it, reconciliation, negotiation, mediation, arbitration, and accountability, and I'll tell you this just up front. As we go from left, overlook, to right, accountability, they become less fun, <laughs> okay? So the further to the left that we can stay, probably the more uh, comfortable we will be. Anybody just really like conflict? I don't. I, I don't like conflict at all. Uh, and yet, <clears throat> there's conflict all over the place. Uh, so we need to learn how to deal with this and deal with it uh, appropriately. And so we want to talk about these six peacemaking responses. This is just a, just a very quick overview of these. We're not going to just really dig in. We're going to talk more as we go through some of the other uh, steps, but I want to introduce them, kind of get you familiar with them 
Uh, and you can, I, I think you'll probably see where you fit in uh, to this and maybe in different situations where you fit in. Um, <clears throat> all right, let me catch up to where I'm supposed to be here. Uh, the six in the center can be broken down to the three on the left side and the three on the right side. And we're going to call the three on the left side personal peacemaking responses. Why? Because they don't involve anybody else. Once you go past the center line of negotiation, once you get into mediation, arbitration, and accountability, you've now brought an outside party into your conflict. With the first three, uh, me and the other individual are going to work this out just between us. Once we cross the line, now we need somebody else to come in to help us mediate, arbitrate, and hold us accountable for what, we've, uh, what we're dealing with. So the personal peacemaking responses are those done privately between the persons uh, directly involved. <clears throat> no one else even needs to know that there is a conflict. And I'll, I, let me just throw this in there right now. This this just a heads up. If you deal with a conflict appropriately, no one else will know about it. Once you begin talking and telling other people about it, you've now opened the door to go to the other side and 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 maybe not require going to the other side, but you're you're pushing this to the other side of getting other people involved. Uh, if you really want peace, you need to try to maintain the privacy of the matter, whether you're the offendor or the offendee. If you don't want to escalate this to a bigger problem, you need to try to deal with it in private. That's what the Bible teaches, and that's what we'll look at. But if you don't like conflict, try to stay with overlook, reconciliation, and negotiation. Once you get past that, then we, start, then we start really ramping up the conflict. So let's talk about and introduce this thought of overlooking the offense. And I know there are folks that right away say, but wait a minute, they were wrong. Preacher, I can't overlook this. Okay, well, we can go beyond that, but let's just talk about this. We're trying to be peacemakers and the Bible does say when it's possible. If it be possible, leave peaceably with how many men? All men, all right? Now, that's, that's free. We're not really looking at that right now, but I just want to help you understand something. Conflict is going to happen. We need to try to work it out in the, in the least conflicting way possible, all right? Let's confine this and, and deal with this as they say, nip it in the bud as quickly as we can. Now, not every conflict can be, not every conflict, conflict should be overlooked. But truthfully, a whole lot more could be overlooked than is overlooked. Somebody say amen. amen. <laughs> I mean, we <clears throat> conflict on every side, and a lot of it is just petty Silliness. Can I say that without offending anybody? I don't mean to cause conflict on the morning I'm teaching how not to have conflict, but th the truth of the matter is there's just a lot of petty conflicts going on that then get escalated and somebody else has to step in and, and resolve those situations, all right? And I, I, don't, I don't mind. That's why God put me here, but we, we just need to try to negotiate this a little better. So <clears throat> I think I need to move forward. <clears throat> Let's talk about these first three, personal or private peacemaking. And uh, I've got the verses there for you, so hopefully you can follow me in your Bibles uh, to these passages, maybe take a note, maybe underline something, highlight something, uh, maybe something there that will help you with that. First verse that I want to look at very briefly is Proverbs 19.11. Proverbs 19.11. And I would say Proverbs is a very good place for you to read if you want to learn about overcoming conflicts, there's a lot of good thoughts throughout there that will help you. Proverbs 19.11 says, The discretion of a man deferreth his anger, 
And it is his glory. It is his glory, it says, to pass over a transgression. Let me pray with you real quick. Father, I want to thank you for your love for us. And thank you for a word uh, that has, is complete, entire, wanting nothing, and is, is, deals with all these situations and helps us to see how to avoid and deal with conflicts and, and many other issues and challenges in life. I pray that you'd help us to understand these principles and put them into practice in our lives that we might be a blessing and a help to others as well in Jesus' name. Amen. Discretion. <clears throat> I preached a message on Wednesday night about self-control. Self-control is important. And self-control is required if you want to have discretion. <clears throat> if you really want to stop and pause and think about it, it would really help if you deferred your anger and overlook and pass over a transgression. It would be, and by the way, you say, well, they don't deserve it, and they were wrong. What does it say? It says, it is his glory to pass over. If you can do it, it will help you. It will be a blessing to you to pass over the transgression. Now, I get it. They've got a problem. They did something offensive, but it will help you if you learn discretion and learn to control your emotions. Say, you know what? I'm going to love them like Christ loved them, forgive them like Christ forgives them, and I'm just going to drop it. Now, it can't always be done. I'm not saying it can be. I'm just saying this. It will be glory for you, the Bible says, if you can do it. First Peter chapter four, verse number eight. First Peter chapter four, verse number eight. This is where that thought goes. Um, again, we'll spend more time on these later looking at this, talking about this, but <clears throat> just want to kind of introduce these thoughts to you and get you praying about how we should be and should want to be. First Peter four, eight. You found that spot? Okay, and above all things, what does that mean? What does above all things mean? It means it, it's something that ought to be fought for, desired, ag aggressively uh, tried to get a hold of. Above all things, have fervent charity, not fervent anger, fervent heat. No, it says fervent love, fervent charity among yourselves. For charity covereth the multitude of sins. You know, the Bible says that most sins should probably be dealt with this way. Most sins should probably be dealt with this way. Not all, but most. Overlooking is a form of forgiveness. It requires the same, same responses that forgiveness require, the same reaction that forgiveness uh, has when you forgive somebody like Christ forgave them, you don't dwell on it. You don't sit and meditate, man, they just really wronged me. Man, that was just terrible. You don't go gossiping around and telling everybody else about it. That's not what Jesus does with your sins. Praise God, right? <laughs> you don't allow it to grow and fester inside of you to cause bitterness and anger to well up inside of you. But again, this is where most conflict should be handled and the way most sin should be addressed. <clears throat> Overlooking an offense. That is the least obstructive, destructive, harmful way to deal with an offense. Notice the second one. The next peacemaking response, the offenses that are too large, you say, well, I just can't let this go. I can't overlook it. I can't, I can't, it's going to bother me. It's going to well up and cause bitterness. Well, let's deal with it. <clears throat> These offenses probably have already hurt the relationship. They're already festering. They're already causing problems in the relationship. And if they're left alone, they will cause a big problem. 
And that's where this response of reconciliation needs to happen. You know the verse, I've taught it, I've preached it, Matthew chapter 5, look at verse 23 and 24. And <clears throat> this would be a good spot to, to, to shove a, uh, a ribbon or a card or stick a finger and leave it there for a little while because we'll be in and out of Matthew chapter 5. It says, therefore, if, verse 23, therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there remembers that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come offer thy gift. What does God say? He said, reconciling yourself to your brother is important enough to God to say, that you brought your offering this morning? I'm not really interested. I need you to go deal with the problem. I need you to go talk to your brother. I need to go fix this problem and then come and give it. It's not that God doesn't want it. It's not that God says you can't give it. It's just this. Our personal conflict will also get in the way of our relationship with God. That's why if, if we can do number one, overlook the offense, we need to do it just like we have been. We have forgiven them. I've forgiven you. I'm not going to bring it up to you. I'm not going to dwell on it in here. I'm not going to it's gone. That, the next step is I need to come to you and actually have the conversation that says, hey, let's work this out. You offended me, and we need to get this resolved. All right? Because if we don't, we now have a problem also in our relationship with God. I think this is critical. I think this is important because far too many times people take that escape response and say, I, th nope, denial, there is no problem. Just like last week we talked about, there is no problem. Well, yeah, there is your bitterness. And because of your bitterness, now you have a problem with God, and, and you and God now have a problem. You're divided from God, not just your brother, well, even, even if they were the party that was wrong. That's why this peacemaking is so important because we can't continue in our relationship with God without it. He said, well, fine, then I'm just going to forget about it. Well, you don't want to do that. But that's where a lot of people go, isn't it? Bless God, if they're going to be in church, I ain't going to be because I ain't going to sit in the same church with them. Have you ever heard that? Come on now. And the minute you have that attitude, you've broken your relationship with God as well. Is it really worth that? <clears throat> Turn with me to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2. See, here's, here's where we need to be. Here's where God wants us to be. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, they got a problem. He says, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Then he says, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. See, Jesus wants us to be the spiritual person to help. They got a problem. Everybody got a problem. We need to be the one that helps them. Don't just abandon ship. Don't just say, forget you and, and walk off. We need to be the one that tries to help this situation. Okay? Now, can we fix everybody? Can we force anybody to do anything? No. But he said it is our responsibility, if there is a brother overtaken in a fault, if we see that and we're spiritual, we need to consider ourselves and our condition, and then we need to help them as much as possible. So let me move to the third thought on this left side of the peacemaking negotiation. Negotiation. Once you engage 
someone in a conflict. There needs to be some negotiating going on. Now understand this as well. In any conflict, there's probably more than one person that has a problem. Now there may have been one person that initiated the problem or one person that, that, that really caused the problem or whatever, but how many of us are sinners? All of us are sinners, right? So we can't, look, we can't point the finger at them, as they say, without knowing that there's, there's a part of this that probably has to do with me as well. And so we need, again, just like Galatians said, we need to have the spirit of meekness, and we need to consider ourselves lest we fall into the muck as well. In most situations where an offense has occurred, there are both emotional and physical challenges that need to be addressed and dealt with. Forgiveness, I'm going to say, is more emotional than physical. There may be physical aspects or physical things that need to be forgiven, but forgiveness is an emotional part. It's a decision that we make in here. The biggest hindrance to forgiveness is your emotion. Most of us know the truth. God says we should forgive. Most of us know that. But we still struggle with forgiveness because of our emotions. So emotions is primarily a, 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 uh, an emotional, spiritual challenge and oftentimes, the, this thing of negotiation deals with the physical part of the, the challenges, the, the offenses that are there. And by physical, I mean sometimes there needs to be restitution. Somebody stole something, broke something, hurt something, whatever the case, there, there is a restitution that God requires in those cases to be uh, sometimes there needs to be this negotiation process to deal with how are we not going to allow this to happen again? What, what needs to happen? And, and sometimes, remember David and Bathsheba? He killed her husband Uriah, and then he took her, after he got her pregnant, he took her as his own. The baby died. And God's still not done. He's still upset with him. And David writes Psalm 51, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Okay? Nathan, the prophet, had to go to him and say, You're the man. You're the guy. There, and, and, and he had to negotiate with him and say, Here's the problem. Here's what the problem is. And here's what we're going to do about the problem. There, had to be, and there needs to be that negotiation that's there to get the conflict resolved, okay? You're at Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, I take it. I saw many of you turning. You've picked up on this. It says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So here's the truth. We're... We're in conflict, and <clears throat> I can't overlook it, so I must address it. I must come to you. I must open up to you and share it with you and try to work this out. And we're going to negotiate how that's going to happen. We're going to talk about what needs to happen, what should have happened, what shouldn't have happened, and what needs to happen so that we can restore the relationship the way it should be. You know, <clears throat> I know this may be hard to believe for some of you, but do you know that the relationship can be better after conflict than before? You realize that? Do you realize that it should be better after than before? <clears throat> I don't even remember who it was, but I had a preacher one time say, making up is the best part. Talking about conflict with his wife. 
It, it sounds like Bill, but I'm not sure that it was, actually. I, I think it was somebody else that I heard talk about it. But the reality is, in today, where we're at today, we get so emotionally tied up that not only are we not willing to forgive, if we do come to, the, to, to reconcile and negotiate the problem, we were best friends, but not anymore. I'll forgive you. I'm going to let it go. But don't count on me at your birthday party. <laughs> Gift? Forget it. Am I telling you the truth? That's the way it has devolved today. But that's not the way it should be. Once we work this out, we should be closer than ever before. Wives and husbands, parents and children, brothers and sisters. That's the way it's supposed to be. Once we work through the conflict, negotiate, once it's done properly, that relationship and that bond should be stronger than it ever was before. Not wad it up and throw it in the trash can. I'll go find me another bestie. That's why we need to talk about these things. That's why we need to study this. That's why we need to understand, because we need peacemakers, not just to kind of smooth it over. No, we need to fix it and make it better, right? <clears throat> so that's where these first three, that's where these first three, overlooking, reconciliation, and negotiation come in, right? And again, I've not got anybody else. Seth hasn't gotten involved with me and Paul. Paul didn't tell him. I didn't tell him. Nobody else has told him. It's just me and Paul dealing with that. If I overlook it, Paul may not even know about it. Man, he might have offended me. I might say, you know what? I love him too much to hold on to that. Done. Forgiven. Maybe I need to say, no, Paul, listen. That was bad. I didn't like it. We shouldn't do that. I want to maintain our relationship. Let's not do that anymore, okay? Okay, good. I appreciate that. We might have to negotiate. But at the end, our relationship should be stronger, and nobody else is the wiser. Nobody else knows anything about it. How many times is that done today? Rarely, right? We have Facebook. People on the other side of the planet know about The aliens are tuned in and they know what's going on in your family's life. <sighs> if there is an advanced life other than God in heaven, which is the only advanced life I believe there is, by the way, if there is advanced life somewhere else, they are shaking their heads hard. What are they doing? Anyway, let's move on. Let's move on, right? We've talked about overlooking, reconciliation, negotiation. Now let's get the third parties involved, and let's talk about public peacemaking. Again, this is the least friendly part. This is not pretty, all right? This normally, you know, we talked about last week the attack uh, uh, side of this, those, th those three on the right. Uh, where, where murder is the end result. These are leaning that way, right? You get much further down past mediation, and this becomes very, very un, unfriendly. <clears throat> Mediators. You need to understand that a mediator is a third-party person who will not take sides, not play favoritism, He's just there, she's just there to hold the people and the parties accountable to the truth and to help them work through whatever it is that, so we can glorify God. Remember, the whole purpose of the center section of peacemaking is glorify God. That's what we're talking about right now. I want God glorified. God is glorified when there's unity. God is glorified when there's peace. God is glorified when, when I am offended... 
and I deal with it properly, and, and then other people can say, wow, that's different. How did you do that? God is my help. How could you forgive him after what he did? Because God forgave me after what I did. See, we're trying to bring glory and honor to God. That's the whole goal here. So the mediator is there because the other people are having difficulty doing it themselves. The mediator is there trying to help them glorify God in the situation. Mediator can help work through the emotional challenges, but they're not in a position to force anybody to do anything. They may ask questions. They may give counsel and advice, but they can't make anybody do anything, Right? That's the first step. I said to hold your finger in Matthew 5, but it's actually Matthew 18. <clears throat> and you will recognize that um, if you turn over to it. Look at verse 16. You're probably already there. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And taking witnesses. Notice it says one or two, two or three. Not the whole church, not your whole family, not cousin Guido. People that can help arbitrate the situation or uh, uh, mediate the situation. People that are helpful, people that are spiritually minded, people that are going to help bring glory and honor to God through this. They're going to hold you accountable for what God says and what God says to do. That's the kind of person you want to seek out in this situation. And again, they're just there to help you. They're just there to encourage you. They're just there to work it out. You don't want somebody that's going to post it on Facebook after you leave. Let's talk about number five, arbitration. This is, we're looking at this as another step, but really, it is and it isn't. You've still got another person or parties involved here, but arbitration is the next step above mediation because mediator doesn't have any, any authority, but an arbitrator does. When you get to arbitration, it means the, the counsel and the encouragement and the, and, the, and the help isn't working. Now I need to go to another level and say, tell you what, will you do me a favor? We're going to agree that Paul is wise and stable and godly, and Paul is going to work it out between me and Seth. He is going to judge in this situation. He is going to tell us which one of us is wrong. He is going to tell us which one of us have to do what to make this right. And I'm going to, we're both going to agree that he's the guy. Whatever he says, we're going to do it, right? Because he's a great big brother. I'm going to stop before we get into, you know, mushy territory, but arbitration. Look at 1 Corinthians 6. I'll show you what I'm talking about here. Uh, <clears throat> Paul here, uh, writing in 1 Corinthians 6, if you have a matter that can't be settled, it would be better, rather than taking it to the courts, rather than taking it to the worldly court system, it would be better to go ahead and get the least and the lowly person in the congregation of his church to be the arbitrator. You go ahead and tell the, the, the most meek, humble, lowly person in the church, rather than taking it to the unsaved world, bring it to somebody in the church and give it to them. Let's read that, 1 Corinthians 6. 1 to 6, dare any of you, notice how he puts this, dare any of you, he says, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust, and do not before the saints, and not before the saints, right. You're taking this to the courts, you're taking this to the world, you're taking this, and you're going you're gonna to wrestle this out in front of the world's eye? Verse 2, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall judge, be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge in the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall uh, judge angels? 
How much more are things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. It is so that there is not a, is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother go to law against with brother, and that before the unbelievers. What is our, what is our purpose? What's the overarching principle that we're talking about? Glorifying God. How can you glorify, lift up God, show the world what a great God we have if we're taking our brothers and sisters to court before the court of law? How is that possible? Bruce? Conflict. Mm -hmm. The two churches met together and they arbitrated, arbitrated that situation. Together in, between, in the church and not in the, in the I believe that that's in Michigan because that's where he was. Uh, prior. Let me ask y'all have you ever heard of that? Have you ever heard of that happening? You ever see that happening? No. And, you know, and that was, that's the model. Well, here's the thing. I realize that, again, I am teaching and preaching what? Countercultural. I'm not teaching what the world says or what, you know, something, some, one of our Supreme Court justices, and I don't want to talk about bad, about Supreme Court justices, but just, uh, here's a comment. We should be ruling, they said, based on the will of the people and the, and the ideology of the people. What? That person, I'm sorry, that person needs to step aside. They don't understand what a judge is for. You should be declaring what is right by the letter of the law, not by the whim and will of the people. That's not the way that's supposed to work. You don't understand your job. And that's why it says here, Give it to the least among the, the church, the least esteemed in the church, and let them judge over it better than going out before the world and having your issues out before the world. But again, that's not done today. What a shame. What a sham. Is it any wonder the church is in the condition it's in? And I'm, I'm talking about, I, I realize the word church is a big word. And it incorporates a lot of things that really aren't church. I'm talking about, is it any wonder why the view and the esteem of, of Christ's body of believers today is so diminished? We've stained it. We've soiled it. We've ruined it by following the practices of the world instead of the directions of the Scriptures. Okay, that's the problem that we have. Mediation. Find somebody that can be spiritually mature enough to encourage you, to challenge you, to help you to see what the right thing is. If you need to, find somebody to arbitrate that, but don't go looking outside the church. If at all possible, get it into the church and deal with it inside the church. And let me give you this this. Principle number six, accountability. If Christians refuse to repent, they are to be taken before the body of the church. Again, I know this isn't practiced today either. This isn't practiced today either, but it's very looked down upon. But I told you, didn't I tell you in the beginning? As we go from the very far left overlooking to the very far right, Account, it's, this is going to get less and less friendly, right? We're, we're, we're liking this less and less at every juncture. But that's why we need to learn these things and do these things the right way, right? 
Matthew 18, verses 17 and 18, And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. If he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That's pretty significant authority, is it not? And that's in the context of dealing with conflict amongst believers. That's what the Lord instructed for his church. It's interesting as you move from overlooking through the different phases uh, and, and, and responses, you move up in these peacemaking responses, you move from the people involved in, this, in the conflict to bringing people from outside the conflict in to decide the conflict and resolve it. Most of the time, it becomes less desirable for everyone involved. Now think about this. If I'm the offended, this becomes less, because now I am being called into question as well because I'm human and I'm a sinner. If I'd have just overlooked it or if I'd have just dealt with it one-on-one, -on -one, it wouldn't be so bad. But now I've got to lay my case out before the least esteemed among the church. I have to bring it before the congregation. Man, that's no fun. What about the offended or the offendee? Well, they don't want their stuff laid out before everybody. It's not fun for them. And, and the, let's, let's mention the mediator, the arbitrator, or the judge in this matter, the church. Is it fun for them either? Absolutely not. Nobody enjoys that. <clears throat> Nobody enjoys And for the record, we have practiced this. Maybe not to the degree that we should have always, but we've practiced it. It's just really hard to get people to even stick around long enough to practice this anymore. Well, fine, I'm leaving. Okay. You can't resolve a conflict when all you see is taillights. <clears throat> all you can do is pray that they figure it out and we can come back together at some point and get it rectified. Nobody likes this as the further to the right we get. The alternative, the alternative, I've already mentioned going against God's will, uh, word and against his will and go out to the legal system, that's not going to make it any better. You're not going to resolve your conflicts out there. All you're going to do is give yourself, the other party, and most sadly God, a black eye. Isn't that so? It's, it's terrible. It's sad. Okay? Rarely, if ever, will there be restoration if you go outside of this plan. Inside of this plan, there can be restoration at any point. Outside of this plan, there likely will be none. Just the way it is. <clears throat> it's also worth noting, just... Just before we close up this morning, it's also worth noting that when you use the escape responses, those that were on the far left, I realize I stopped clicking. Oh, it's because it's the end. Let me go back here. Oop. The escape responses on the far left, denial, flight, suicide, those are focused on the me. What about me? What about what I feel? What about what I think? What about what I want to do? In the middle... Those are focused on the us and the we. Let's resolve this. Let's get this straightened out. Let's figure this out. Okay? I plan on, Lord willing, one more, one more uh, Bible study, one more time together talking about this and hopefully bringing all these principles together and showing how they should work before we move into the next thought the next phase of peacemaking and so i hope that you'll stick around for that 
uh, come back for that. And uh, if you missed it, tune in on YouTube, all right? It's good to have you this morning. You've got about seven minutes to the hour. Let me, let me ask this real quick. Is there any questions or any comments before I close in prayer? Oh, okay. Man, age is a rough, rough thing to deal with, isn't it? Yeah. All right, well, let me pray with you. And you've got six minutes. Father, I want to thank you for the day. Thank you for your love. And I pray that you'd help us not only learn how to be peacemakers, but have the will and desire to be peacemakers in the world today, that you might receive the glory and the honor, and we might be glorified and helped in it as well. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, <clears throat> you've got a few minutes, and then I'll meet you right back here.